Good morning. I want to welcome you to a time of walking through our Sunday School lesson for this week. Um, as we've looked at over the past couple of weeks, um, it, we're talking about discipleship and what it is to be a disciple. Uh, we started off a couple of weeks ago uh, talking through the call to make disciples, but that um, often begs the question, what is a disciple? If we're going to make something, we need to know what we're talking about. What's our end goal? What's our end product? What do we want to be and what do we want to make? What are we called to be and what are we called to make? And so, uh, you know, we, we've, we've been talking through our definition that we bring from Matthew 419, which is uh, Jesus calling his disciples, his original disciples saying, come and follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. And I realize I keep using different translations of it because I've read so many of them, uh, but they're all basically the same. And there's that call to come and follow me. And that's what we talked about last week, the committed follower of Jesus. A disciple is a committed follower of Jesus um, who is uh, being uh, transformed. And that's the, and I will make you. Um, who is being transformed. And we talk about, today we're going to talk about what... Um, what are you being transformed into? If you are a, disi a disciple of Jesus, what are you being transformed into? And that, uh, that's where we'll spend the bulk of our time today. Um, but in our definition, we say, who's being transformed into his likeness? And so we'll, we'll look at that, and we'll also talk about the how and the why of being transformed. Why is it important? And, so, and then lastly, in our definition, a committed follower of Jesus who is being transformed into his likeness and dedicated to his mission. And that's what we'll talk about next week. Uh, we'll talk about what the mission of Jesus is because uh, it's, it's really difficult to go about God's business here on this earth if we don't understand what Jesus was about and what he calls us to do. Besides just making disciples, uh, and, and that's a big, big part of it, of our mission, uh, but to what end? Why are we to do that? There's a purpose for us to do that, not just um, for our own gratification, not just because he said so, um, but God has lined that out and Jesus had li has lined that out and talks about what his purpose is and ultimately what God's will is. And so uh, we'll talk about that next week, but today we're going to spend our time uh, looking at what it means to be transformed. And um, in the, the, disciple, the disciple's life, uh, here today in the modern church, typically what happens and this may not be your experience, but I've seen it happen over and over and over again. We press really hard for a decision, right? We, we say, you need to pray this prayer. You need to walk this aisle. You need to make a decision of a commitment. You need to be converted. You need to give your life to Jesus. Uh, in some ways, you need Jesus to come live in your heart, or I guess the Holy Spirit to indwell you would be a, a more biblical way of talking about that. Um, there's a few spots about Jesus in your heart, but it's a, it's a little bit different. And so we, we talk about that. You make this huge decision to ask forgiveness, to repent, to ask God to forgive you through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, and to allow you into an eternal uh, way of living, which starts then and carries on until uh, you die and are raised again, just as Christ was. Um, and and so we, we push for that decision. We talk about it a lot with people uh, and that, you know, Brother Mike has talked repeatedly about uh, his end goal was to knock on a door and get someone to pray a prayer. But that's, um, and, and that's important. That's what we talked last week, sorry. Uh, following Jesus is, call, the call to following Jesus is important. He starts that way and calls people to come, come after and join with him. And that's precisely what we do when we evangelize. We go and we, we try and draw people in, but... That is only the first part of being a disciple. It's the only the first part of what the disciples have that we see in their life. They decide to follow him, decide to abandon everything, which again is different than the definition we get oftentimes. They decide to follow him. If we are a disciple, we decide to follow him. Um, and what we looked at last week is with just abandon of everything else, that we die to who we were and we are moved into a life where where his priorities, his goals, his leadership, his guidance um, is what ultimately drives us. It, it moves us. It, um, it's not just a way that we order our lives to where he is kind of in the front, but instead we tear down everything else that would compete 
uh, for his leadership in our lives, um, for his lordship in our lives. And so um, there's that, that look of following Jesus. And when we, we make disciples, we call people into that, right? Well, the problem is we, we typically in the church today, we start there and then we jump to, you need to go do some work, which is great. I, I like that we have people who are very dedicated to doing the things that God has called them to do, what they see in the scriptures, the, the mandates on their lives. We are doers, people who act and have projects and want to accomplish much for the Lord. Um, but the issue is we have the conversion and then you need to do this, but there's this middle section that is so important to the disciples' life. Because if you think about it, Peter, when he was called, was a fisherman. It's what he knew. Um, Jesus called him to walk with him. And even after walking with Jesus, what happened? Peter denied Jesus. Even though he declared who Jesus was, he rebuked Jesus, he denied Jesus, he ran away back to fishing, reverted back to who he was, and it took Jesus restoring him and charging him uh, to go out before he truly was the rock upon which the church was built. Um, it took the, the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost for him to really uh, walk in the way and do the things that God had called him to do and Jesus had charged him. It wasn't just, yes, we follow you, all right, let's go do some stuff. Instead, it was, yes, we'll follow you, but we're going to have our hearts changed, our minds changed, our actions, our thoughts. Um, everything within us is going to shift into a different way of being. Um, we, we, we look at that in, in, in Baptist parlance and modern I'd, verbiage and what we say, we call it sanctification. That first, that call to come and follow um, is, is a decision for justification, that we are justified and saved uh, through that faith. Uh, we've dedicated our life to Him and given it unto Him. We've died to ourself and we are raised with Him. You know, I've been crucified with Christ uh, the life I once lived in the f I no longer live, um, the life I lived in the flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God. Like, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There is this, this idea that our old life is done, and that we are made new, and that's that, that decision to follow. Um, but from there, um, we don't just start doing whatever, whatever we think God has for us. I mean, we do, but, but we can't just jump in and say, all right, I don't need anything else. I've got everything I need. Uh, sure, Scripture attests that, that God has blessed us with everything in the, in the heavenly realms, heavenly places, all the spiritual blessings, that the fullness of the Spirit is within us. It's not a matter of we need more Holy Spirit a little bit down the way. We have to, to die to ourselves and, and allow the Holy Spirit to move. That's a different way of talking about it. But, but there's this process of being changed, of being transformed. Because um, when we jump to acts and works, then we become legalistic again. When we jump to acts and works, we, we become frustrated or um, we feel like we're, we're a disappointment. Because um, think about it. If you are supposed to go and tell the world about Jesus, but you're not doing it, why not? Or if you're supposed to go and bear witness about what he has done, um, and you cannot... Uh, speak of anything other than a decision that was 40 years ago, then, then what, what has he really done? How has your life been shaped? How has your relationship with God uh, been changed? How has your interaction and your, the, the end goal of who you are, your purpose for life, how is that expressed if nothing has happened since the day that you walked an aisle, since the day that you prayed a prayer? Um, if that's the case, then, then God's work is very, very limited, and it's not, um, it's not transforming us into anything. It's not making us into anything. Um, that, that word that he says, you, I will make you to become, is a future tense. I'm going to progressively work through this so that you will become something completely different than yourself. Um, and so, you know, talking about that evangelism, uh, when you ask people, when's the last time you talked about what God has done in your life? They may say it in Sunday school, they may say it at church, but most of the time you get a, a head scratch and, and people look down at the floor and they, they feel shame. It ends up in shame because they have this idea of, I'm supposed to be doing this, but I'm not doing it enough. Or you ask somebody, what about scripture? Are you reading the Bible? A lot of people 
will say, yes, I am. But many times I've heard the answer of, I'm not doing, I'm not doing it enough. Yes, I'm doing it, but not enough. Not as much as I should. And there's this idea that we go from conversion to doing things. And in those doing things, if we don't do enough, then we end up in frustration, we end up in guilt, we end up in shame. And so we just stop doing those things. Um, or we do things that, that don't line up with the mission of Jesus, which we'll see next week. So um, I just want to put that out there, that there's something in between that, that the church over the last, uh, well, years, decades, centuries, has abandoned that, that there's this transformation for who we were to who we will be. And that is an ongoing transformation, that, that my son, who is uh, eight years old, as he learns to trust in Jesus more, that his life will look different. Because right now, he wants to look after his own interests so often. But instead, as he is transformed, he will begin to think in the way that Jesus did. He will be able to trust in the way that Jesus did. He will be able to uh, make disciples in the way that Jesus did. He will be a follower of Jesus and look more like him. So that's, that's where we are today. I know that's a long intro. Um, but it's kind of the state of what the church is, you know. Um, the big question is whether or not we need, the big question with all this is whether or not we need to be changed. Um, you say, yes, I've, I've made a decision. I'm going to move into a life that, that does the things that God has called me to do. Do I really need to be changed? Is that even something that God wants? I mean, it, it says, and we'll look at it in a little bit, in 2 Corinthians 5, that I am a new creation uh, I, it already happened. It's done. And yet we see over and over and over again um, this idea of a process of what needs to happen, what our part is, what God's part is, and then the Holy Spirit, how it continually adds and changes us. And so um, the, the easy question, do a follower of Jesus, do disciples of Jesus, do they need to be changed? Does, does my life need to look different than it did before I chose to follow Jesus? Is it something that is absolutely necessary, or is it merely a good thing that will probably happen if I go to church enough or I do the right things? Um, does God desire that we are transformed? And the easy answer is, is yes. Um, but that's often reduced to behavior modification. I'm just going to act differently. I did these things, now I'm going to do those things because I recognize these are sin, so I'm going to do something different. Well, that isn't transformation at, it, at, your, at your deepest parts. That's just on the surface. Like... If there were words that I said, which there were, before I decided to follow Jesus, and then I stopped saying those words, yes, you could call that a change, but in my heart, those things are still there. If, if I had a habit that didn't seem to line up with Scripture, and especially didn't line up with the people in the church, and then I stop it, because they tell me to stop it, and they show me in Scripture where it is, I'm going to be doing something different, uh, differently, but it's going to not necessarily be at my heart, in my core. I haven't been transformed in my inmost being, in my deeper parts. Instead, I'm just changing what I do. And, and by sheer will, I am pretty good at that. I can stop doing things whenever I feel like it. I can start doing things whenever I feel like it. When I get my mind to it, I can go exercise for four, five, six days, three weeks on end, but then I just get tired of it and I stop. Um, if I don't want to eat things with sugar, I don't eat things with sugar because I can will myself into doing that. Well, the Christian life, um, it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have that sinful nature that is within us. Um, we are unable on our own to change ourselves into a life um, living for God. Um, we are unable uh, to, to do things under our own will. So should my life look different? Yes, but there's something that needs to change and be continually changed. Uh, and you look at, is this God's desire uh, from the beginning that we all be changed? Well, from Adam and Eve, probably not. But when they decided that they didn't trust Him, that they didn't believe in Him, then they... Um, he, he had to make changes. Uh, you know, you look at, uh, even in Ezekiel, uh, the Israelites, he called, uh, called Abram from long ago. 
and he changed the heart of Abram, and, and we, we see him changing to Abraham, but even then he didn't believe God. And then he pushes um, a little bit down the way, and, and Abram, he decides, even before he's Abraham, he lies to the king of Egypt because he was afraid of him, because he didn't trust God to protect him or, or provide for him, even though God had called him. So he had this great faithful call to go, and yet Abram says, I don't know about this. I'm going to lie and say that Sarah, Sarai is my sister. And then a little bit later, God is covenanted with Abraham, and what happens? Um, he doesn't believe what God says, and so instead he listens to his wife Sarah, and Sarah says, take my handmaiden. Um, and so Abraham has a son, but it's not the way that God had said. And then we go a little bit further with Abraham um, in another land, and talking to the king and saying, take she's not my wife, she's my sister, same old lie, and he didn't trust that God would protect and provide. And so, um, you know, there's all these instances of Abram and Abraham, same guy, God is transforming him, he's given him a new identity, and yet he still, his heart, isn't inclined towards the Lord. But eventually we have Abraham taking his son Isaac, up onto the mountain and he trusts the Lord and he's going to sacrifice a son because he trusts and knows who God is. And so in that moment, he raises the knife. He's, he's got him bound up. He raises the knife and God stays his hand and says, I know that you are faithful. So here is a sacrifice and provides a ram for him. Right? Um, God has changed not just the outward activities of Abram at that point, but in his heart, because Abraham now believes that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do. He, he, he truly believes that God is God. And we see that transformation over and over and over and over and over again with so many uh, in the Old Testament. Um, I think about the way that God approaches his people in Israel who have strayed from him, who have decided that they're going to take their own lives into their own hands, grumble against God, not trust what he's doing, um, and God says, okay, um, you're going to be in some bad places for a while. But then he gives this promise, and he says, uh, this is Ezekiel 11, 19, and it's echoed throughout Jeremiah. Um, it's echoed in a few other places and, and quoted again in Hebrews on chapter 8. It says, I will give them one heart. Now, they've lived by the law, but in the future, this is what I'm going to do. I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. So this heart of stone um, has a lot of uh, details about it, but it's, it's them not able to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's them giving God the bare minimum or even less than that because they want to pursue themselves. It's them believing the lie that was said in the beginning. Did God really say this? Do you really need to trust the Lord? Um, is He really who He says He is? Is He authentic with you? Is He being genuine with you? And instead, they decide to do their own thing. And so God says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change their hearts. I'm going to take out the thing um, that is not inclined towards me, and I'm going to give them a heart of flesh. Well, that heart of flesh is going to allow them to walk with God. Not just walk in fear of God, but to walk with God. Um, he declares how he will interact. Um, and this is, this is truly a change of identity, to be his people. And in the New Testament, we see a lot more this idea of his family. Uh, again, another example we think of um, with, with Abram, as I already mentioned, Going into Moses, he goes from a man with severe anger issues who doesn't really know who he is, who is separated from his people, um, and definitely from his God, but he is called to walk with God and to be a leader of a nation. And he has the audacity and confidence in God um, to ask for a glimpse of God's glory in Exodus 34. I mean, think about it. He makes excuses in front of the burning bush about why he cannot. And God says, I will be with you and I will change you. He changes Moses' heart because Moses walked in fear and anger and all those things that drive the human condition. All those things that are rooted in ourselves. And yet, 
God decided that he was going to change Moses' heart and, and, and give him affection for God and leadership from God and able to follow him. Um, it's full of examples from, from the judges to Samuel, Elijah and Elisha, um, even to David, uh, some of the other, other kings a bit later on. You see these pictures of God taking somebody and, and changing them transforming them, their hearts, from someone who was about their own business into someone who, who longs for what God is going to do. And, and yeah, it doesn't always, it's not always constant. It's not always a, they put their hand to it and they go, but there's still a sense of God continually transforming their hearts, helping them to understand who He is and who they are in light of that. So, so the question I have for you is, how does God's transformation of individuals, of these people, lead to the working of His will among His people, you know, the Israelites? How does that change? As He changes the hearts of individuals, how does that change uh, His people Israel? I mean, think about it. Moses leads them, right? He is the intercessor. He asks the Lord uh, for favor and not to destroy the people, remind the Lord of, of who He is so that they um, will not perish. And so, saves them that right, because he has a perspective on the people like God's, not just his own, because if I were Moses, I would have said, that's right, wipe those guys out, we'll start something new, let's go. Um, and yet Moses had compassion for the people, as God had compassion for the people. He was changed. He wasn't the guy who murdered someone anymore, right, because he was angry. Uh, because he saw some, some bad stuff. Uh, instead, he was the man who pleaded for the lives of people. And that's a change from a uh, man-centered heart to a God-centered heart. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more examples, but I want to look into uh, the New Testament. You know, that expectation of a transformed life. One of, the, one of the things that we look at all the disciples, we don't have, an, a, we don't have a lot of explicit uh, statements that Jesus, your life will change, but there's an expectation there that he has set. In fact, uh, you look at the disciples, you've got people who are fishermen, you've got a tax collector, probably some tradesmen in there that did a lot of different things, and their vocations changed, but also we see their hearts changed. Um, you know, I've already mentioned Peter and the switch from a guy who is probably pretty rough and tumble um, into someone who is proclaiming the truth about the Lord. And there are some, some hiccups along the way, and yet God continues to transform his heart into the one that is after his. His perspective on people changes. Um, Jesus says uh, that they are going to look like him. Essentially, it says in Luke 6.40, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will become like his teacher. It's something that they all knew as disciples, and yet Jesus says it here that the expectation, if you are my follower, if you're my disciple, you're going to look like me. And I imagine in that room or in that place, because um, it's kind of sandwiched in there um, in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so it's probably an outside place. But he, he says it and everybody says, well, yeah, of course. Um, and this is right there where Jesus is talking about judging other people. Um, but he says, a disciple is going to look like his teacher. You, if you are my disciples, are going to look like me. And so there's an expectation on us to be transformed into his likeness, to be changed from who we were into, uh, into looking like him, um, which oddly enough is what we were created to do in the first place, right? We are image bearers of God. Uh, we were created in his image. And so uh, where we are from Adam and Eve who pursued their own desires, their own wants, who who said, I'm not sure God is the best thing for us. I'm not sure God is being truthful with us. We're going to do our own thing. We see something shiny and we chase after it. Um, that's what it is. It looked good to eat, so they went after it. Uh, she went after it and then he followed suit. From that point on, we see a pattern of people who decide that they know better than God does. We see it from a whole nation of Israel. And then when we come to Jesus' day, we have a group of people who have decided not just that they know better and are going to go do uh, who knows what and pursue their own desires, but we also have a group of people who have decided 
that they know the best way to interact with God. And in comes Jesus. And Jesus says, you've heard it said, uh, don't murder. You've heard it say, um, don't commit adultery. You've heard it said that um, you, should not have, you should not get divorced. You've heard it said, um, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You've heard all these things, um, but you guys have decided the best way to interact with God, to live this life with Him. And, and Jesus declares, no, no, you haven't. You have to be changed. You have to learn the way to do that. And He was their teacher. He was the one to say, this is how we do this. And if I'm to be His disciple, then I'm to be changed from my pursuit of myself, or even my pursuit of the best way I think I should interact with a God who, honestly, I would have a different picture of. I would say, eh, many people think God is the best version of themselves. They think that God is, um, you know, the, a better, better picture of their father. Uh, or they think that God is um, someone distant or someone grumpy or who knows what. They've got this image. And Jesus comes to, to wipe that out and says, I'm going to transform that image and I'm going to transfer your heart. I'm going to reveal the father to you so that you might be changed. And changed into what? his likeness as his disciples, because that is a, a commonly held belief that anyone who is a disciple looks like his teacher. I want to think, you know, Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he's talking about, um, talking about the way that God had drawn them all in together, the Jews and the Gentiles, everyone together, and he says, look, this because we're all here, it doesn't matter. The differences aren't there. What you need to do is imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul was trying to, to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And he says, look, y'all don't know Jesus. Y'all haven't seen him. Y'all haven't met him. I'm talking about him. You've heard him preached. So if you need somebody to look like, look like me because I'm trying to look like him. And that's a picture we get of being a disciple maker. I am helping someone else to look like me, yes, but also to look like Jesus as I am striving to look like him, to be transformed. So I ask, who has influenced you in your life? Who has, has heavily influenced you? What characteristics do you have that were theirs? I look every day at, and hear things from my father, from my mother, from my grandfather, uh, from others. Uh, even in the time that I've been here, I have started using words that Brother Mike uses, which sometimes scares me, but other times they're good because uh, he, he's got good words. Um, who, have you inf who has influenced you and who do you sound like? Who do you look like? Who do you act like? What mannerisms do you have? I see them all the time in my kids. They, they talk like me. They walk like me. Um, they get excited about the things that I get excited about. And they, um, yeah, they just, they are copies of me, right? And then I, I want to think about what characteristics do you expect from someone who follows Jesus? You know, what do you think you should, if you're supposed to be a disciple of Jesus who looks like your master, him, and his likeness, being changed in his likeness, what characteristics do you expect? What should you look like? And that's not a question to get you down and say, oh, I haven't quite mastered it yet, because... Yeah, that's, that's not what we're after. Um, but if you, if you have a list of things that you think you should look like, uh, then perhaps we should look at those things and see if they line up with, with the Jesus we see in the Bible. Or are they a list that's outside of that? They're a list that's made up by somebody else. Think about how God has revealed himself. Again, Exodus 34 is a great place to do that. How Jesus has revealed the Father and in so doing revealed himself because the fullness of the deity was, it was pleased God to have the fullness of the deity dwell in Jesus. Um, he is, if Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So we see how God is revealed in him. And if we're supposed to be like him, then we're going to end up being like God. We're going to, that image bearer again, be like Jesus, be like God, and, and bear the image that he created Adam to have. Um, what are you expecting to look like, to be transformed into? So, 
the the question another question that I have uh, you know does God desire that we be transformed absolutely as as we have followed the path of Adam now we're to follow the the life of Christ right um, but there's there's a question of whether or not that will just happen does it just happen if I go to church enough if I read my Bible enough if I pray enough Yes and no. Um, the expectation when we call people to follow and be converted to make a decision, and then we leave them and say, come to church and just be a part of something, well, that, that leaves them alone. It becomes optional then for them to live transformed lives. Um, we, we typically impose, I say we, the church at large, especially Baptist churches, impose some sort of individual behavioral mandate. Um, and then we... Say, live like this, and show up here, and you'll be good. But that, is, that has not been the case. I have encountered so many people who, who have no clue what it is to be transformed, who are still carrying around uh, the same baggage, the same thoughts about God, the same uh, anger and hurt and bitterness for decades. Because they don't understand what it is to walk with God. The freedom, the fullness of life that he says uh, is in John 10.10, 10, you know, that he comes and have life to the full is not apparent. It's not abundant because they don't understand what it is to live this life that has changed. And so if we don't understand what that means, then we, we really can't achieve it. We're just stuck in a place that's frustrating. And again, what I said before, we... We boil that down to, I'm not doing enough, and then I walk in shame and guilt, which is definitely not what God had intended for this life. Um, and he, he calls us some pretty big things, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, so, so we need to walk in those things. Uh, so the question is, uh, do we have a part in this transformation? Is there something we need to do? And I'm not saying that it needs to be work so that we look different. It's not just, I need to change my behaviors. There is that as the Lord leads. Um, but there's a part in this transformation that, um, that we have in allowing the Holy Spirit to work. Um, you know, one of the, the big questions uh, in, well, one of the, the big passages in, in Jeremiah 24-7, and this again is echoed in a lot of places, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, so they shall return to me with their whole heart. You know, there's that idea of, of coming to the Lord with everything that we have. Um, his longing from the beginning, and I've mentioned this already, for Adam and Eve in the garden was for a people who would follow him with their whole hearts. Uh, when they were tempted, um, he put the question, he put into the question uh, the intent of God's own heart, whether God cared for them. And so he says, let's, let's pull that forward into um, transforming you. Even, even with those who decided that they had a way of doing this, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, you know, Jesus has some pretty strong words for them because they've decided how they're going to interact with God. Um, they've decided uh, what this transformation part, and they've left that part out. They've just put down a list of rules. You do this, you don't do this, and that's it. Well, um, you know, they, there's this idea that that God calls us um, to be as, as He is. Um, you know, be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as I am perfect. And that seems like an insurmountable thing, but that's part of this transformation process. Have a heart in you, which is also in me. Um, one of the Dallas Willard quotes I like uh, from the Divine Conspiracy, there's a lot of them, but he says, He does not call us to do what He did, not to those actions, but to be as he was. And this is the other part of it, permeated with love, that we are transformed into people that have the love for God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength that he has for himself, and then also to have the love for others that he has, um, have his eyes, um, his heart. Uh, you know, th this, is, this is one of those places where um, we ask, what is our part then? You know, God's going to do his part. He's going to transform. He's going to help us through Jesus, through his scripture, through the work of the Holy Spirit to see who he is, that we may be transformed. Um, what is our part? What do we need to do? Um, 
It's not just attending church and showing up to some things. Um, Luke 9, 23, it says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, we looked at this last week, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Um, dying to self is the first of our parts in transformation. When I hold on to my own will, my own control, whenever I dictate how my life should be, God has no place to move or to change. My heart is still pointed towards me. When I have decided that I know the best way to do things, I've got my list of rights and wrongs, and I do all the rights and I don't do all the wrongs, that's great, but that's not a transformed heart. There's no need for God at that point. There's no need to go into uh, asking Him and inquiring of Him and walking alongside and allowing for the Spirit to move because I already know what I'm supposed to do. I don't need anything else. Well, that looks a whole lot like the Pharisees who have engaged with God in the way that they've decided. And Jesus again calls them whitewashed tombs. He calls them a brood of vipers. He calls them a whole lot of other names that are pretty strong. See, the call of Jesus to follow Him leads into how we are transformed. That we deny ourselves. We lay down our wills. We give up our control and our plans for things. We don't say, God, I've got this, but we recognize the need for Him to be with us and the need for us to be with Him and for Him to be transforming our hearts and working in us through His Spirit. Um, It doesn't just look like giving up my old hobbies. It doesn't just look like doing specific things that, that look better. It's not just uh, giving up old relationships, but he may lead you to do so, so that I can have new churchy relationships. Now, denying self is, a, um, is something that's not just a part of us bending everything to our own will. It's, it's giving up our own will. It's asking the question daily, what do you want from me today? How do I look more like Jesus today? What does Jesus look like? And, and for that matter, what do you look like that I may be changed more into you? It's not a question we often ask because we already know. We've set up our rules and we just walk that way. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, a familiar verse, uh, or a couple verses with people. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So it starts out, you know, as, as Paul or Paul here in, in Romans is, is again talking about pulling everybody together. Um, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Well, this is what we're to do, offering our bodies as sacrifice. That's giving all of ourselves, our time, what we have, who we are. We're going to give those over to God for His use and His purposes. When we understand what it is that He wants to do, which is, uh, I'll use the, since I'm real familiar with it at the moment, uh, at the beginning of Ephesians in chapter 1, it says uh, that He will bring all things under the authority of Jesus Christ at just the right time, that everything will be brought under the authority of Christ. Well, if I understand that that's what he wants to do, then I am going to submit myself, my future, my plans, my pocketbook, my uh, calendar, uh, the things that I own, to work towards his will and his doing in the world. I offer myself up and say, God, I'm yours. It says that's our true and proper worship, which is the only response to God. We looked at that uh, a couple weeks ago whenever the disciples showed up and Jesus was there on the mountain that he appointed them to. They worshiped because that was the only response. And yet, we tend to come up with other ways to do things and show that we worship so much more than God. So then in verse 2 it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, the things that you do. Ephesians 2 uh, says that while we were dead in our trespasses, we fat followed uh, the ways of this world. We followed the uh, the prince of the the spirit of the prince of the air, 
Um, we followed our own desires, our own lusts, our own wants. So do not conform to the pattern of this world. That was the pattern. That is the pattern. If you don't see that, uh, turn on the news. <laughs> Everyone wants to do what they want to do. And we're working on making sure that everybody can do what they want to do unless it infringes upon me. And that's a, a big tenet of critical theory, any of them, is that you cannot um, speak anything into my life unless you've experienced it, unless you've walked straight through that. Therefore, I am able to do whatever it is that I want to do and you can say nothing about it. Of course, at the same time, you can say you can do whatever you want to do, uh, of course, unless it infringes on what I want to do. Um, and then I'm going to complain as loud as I possibly can. I, mean, I see that in my son, right? Uh, I've, I've my almost five-year-old who says, let's go do this. No, we're going to go do this over here. And then, just like that, um, he pitches a fit because... He's fine to let you do what you want to do as long as he gets to do what he wants to do unless it infringes there. That's the way that works. And so we see that in society today that, that everybody wants to do what they want. They pursue their own deeds. They pursue their own desire. They pursue their own fame, their own uh, self-determination and control. They pursue what they want when they want. And that's the pattern of this world. And, and Paul's telling them, don't conform to that. But instead, be transformed. There's that word by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, which is what Jesus was able to do, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. As we offer our sacrifice, our body as living sacrifices, we are also um, being transformed. Our mind is being renewed. It's also being changed. It's being made into the mind of Christ. Uh, the same thing in, in Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus who being very nature God, did not consider godliness something to be grasped or held onto. But instead, um, he considered it robbery. You know, that's a, another form of it. But made himself nothing, emptied himself out, no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. I mean, that, that attitude of, I'm not pursuing, that's that pattern. I'm not pursuing what I want, but instead I'm going to submit myself to the will of the Father and be changed. That's what he calls in Philippians 2 for us to be. Have that same mind which was in Christ Jesus. It's not just about doing the things that Jesus did. Because if I'm all stuck on the doing, then I'm, I'm going to be left feeling disappointed and I'm really going to be felt left feeling inadequate. And then I'm going to be left feeling, felt, yeah, feeling guilty or ashamed. I can't simply turn my heart towards a task to make me more like Jesus. I can't just simply jump from I want to follow Jesus to I'm going to go do the things that I see him doing. I must be continuously changed by him so that I can look more like him. So I can understand what he is about and then I can go and do. Yeah. I want to ask the question, how do you feel about having a role in your own transformation? You know, we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and just assume that it's going to happen, but for each of us, there's a, a part for us to play. You know, there's our part and there's God's part. Our part is, is a lot about squashing our own ambition. Um, how would you describe your responsibility in being changed into Jesus' likeness? That's a big question. And then, what other scriptures come to mind when we think about our role in becoming more like Christ? Um, we're going to uh, kind of move pretty quickly through this next little bit, because I want to know, what is the end goal? Why are we being transformed? Why is it important? Well, 1 Ephesians 2, uh, we talked about it a, a, a little bit ago, um, but it says that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us be beforehand that we should walk in Him. You know, we once we walked following the course of this world, now, um, but God, in verse 4, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. One, that transformation is being alive. From death to life. There's so much in Scripture, especially in Paul's writings, about being dead and being made alive. 
So the question is, how does that new life affect the way that you live? Um, how were you made different when you were made alive in Christ? Um, then we move into 2 Corinthians 5, which is one of my favorite sections. It says, for Christ, this is verse 14, for Christ's love compels us, because we were convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So everybody died, and then we have this life, right? That we live with purpose for him. It's one of those end goals of being changed. It says, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was making reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, you know, we've got this death to life idea that we once were dead, now we're alive. And that's a big part of that transformation of following Jesus. But then there's something more. We are given purpose. Now, Ephesians 2 said we have good works that are planned for us before the foundations of the earth for us to do. This is what 2 Corinthians 5 says, that we are a new creation. Verse 17, we are ministers of reconciliation. 18 and 19, you can, some translations use that exact phrase. We are given the message of reconciliation. Um, in other versions, we are Christ's ambassadors in verse 20. We are the righteousness of God in verse 21. We're not only given life, but we're given identity. Because this is something that changes who we are. Much like Peter is no longer a fisherman, now he's a fisher of men, <laughs> you know, to use that. He is no longer who he was, but now he has a new title. Um, God even changes the names of, of different people, right, to give them a different meaning. We have Simon, who becomes Peter. We've got Saul, who becomes Paul. We've got, in the Old Testament, Jacob, who becomes Israel. We've got Abram, who becomes Abraham. Sarah, or Sarah becomes Sarah. Those are the ones we've listed here today. Um, those people are changed. Their identity of who they are and what they are supposed to be about has changed. Think about it. Before you were, you chose to follow God. You answered that call to follow Jesus. Um, who were you? I'll tell you, I uh, was somebody who was all about my own importance, my own intelligence, my own rightness. I was someone who would deceive just for the sake of convenience, who wanted to look bigger and better than everybody else. And yet, the life of following Jesus and the life that I see is completely different than that. That he's not about himself, but instead, he humbled himself even to the form of a servant, and we're in Philippians 2, so that he could point to the Father. Now, a new identity. And here it says that we are new, that we are Christ's ambassadors, ministers of reconciliation, righteousness of God. It's not just identity, but it's a purpose of what we are to be about in our lives. And, and I'm going to tell you, Paul, even in, in uh, Romans chapter 7, says, Look, I keep trying to do the things that I know are right, and I can't do them. And the things that I don't want to do, I keep doing those. And then he ends with, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, um, through Christ Jesus, that, you know, that, that, that there is this idea that I am going to be changed out of identity and purpose. It's going to be hard. I'm not going to get it right. But God is continually working within me to change it. Even Paul says, I, I have not yet attained um, this hope, this future, this... Um, this level of perfectness um, that we are called to. Instead, he presses onward uh, towards the, up, the upward goal, uh, the upward prize of, of knowing him and then eventually being found with him in eternity. So knowing him now and walking with him now and, and then the future time. Um, so we have this death to life, this identity, a new person we are called, and then a purpose of how to walk that out. And then we look at Colossians 3. Um, that talks about the way we should live. Um, you know, we jump to this section about this is how we need to live, but but he says this is how your life should be. And and before this, this is part of that 
our part we could go back to. Um, put to death, therefore, Colossians 3, verse 5, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Um, and then rid yourself of all these. Put to death is strong. Also rid yourself, which is a little bit weaker, but it's pretty serious. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie. Uh, since you have taken off your old self, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, which is, again, that renewing of the mind and of the heart and the image of its creator. In the image of its creator, the likeness of Christ. We are transformed and being renewed to look more like him. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly, and loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom um, psalms hymns and songs from the spirit singing to god with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do whether in word or deed do it all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god the father through him so there's this call to a new way of life what it's going to look like and what we do is we pursue those attributes and we don't pursue the as dearly loved children. Uh, and think about it. This is what he says again. Therefore, as God's chosen people, that identity, that new, the righteousness of God, that the change that has been wrought, as God's chosen people, then we clothe ourselves with these, not us pursuing those as an end. It's in that identity of who we are. We have to remind ourselves daily, being renewed daily, that that is who we are. Until we know that that is who we are. And we live a life that's reflective of that, which is what's described in Col um, Colossians 3. You know, the, the question we're all is, how does new life lead to a new identity? And how does a new identity lead to a life lived in response to God? Um, you know, one of the, the warnings with all this, we talk about transformation, we talk about um, being changed and how important that is. Uh, for so many people, there's a, there's a warning here. And I think I put it at the beginning as well, but I'm going to put it here. Um, there's this idea of arriving. Right? We have arrived. We are mature, professional Christians. Let's go about and do some work. The problem is, the moment we decide that we have it all there, is the moment we stop relying on God. The moment we, we line up everything the way that we need to have it to get some work done, we, we stop relying on God. We stop trusting in God. We stop asking for the God, asking God, where he's moving, what he wants us to do. And instead, we say, God, give us favor because we've got this. And we've lost it. That's where our maturity ends. That's where we come to a place where we realize we're not mature. Um, it's kind of like being a lifelong learner. You know, I, I learned enough to know that I don't know. That I need to learn more. Same thing in the relationship with God, that mystery uh, that draws us in and stirs our affections for Him. The more we're in, the more it draws us in. The moment we stop and say, No, nah, I got you figured out. I'm good. Is the moment we've, we've lost it. We're no longer being transformed. We're no longer being made into the image of Christ because what we see in Christ is Him continually going back to the Father. We can see Him continually communing with the Father. Right now, He's at the Father's right hand interceding on our behalf in fellowship with the Father. The moment we stand up and say, I got this figured out, I've ordered it all, we're in trouble. So I want to think about spiritual maturity and what, what do you hold up as a mature disciple? Who do you hold up? Where do they need transformation? Where do you need transformation? And you may say, I'm not one to judge other people. Well, when we look at the light, thinking about being transformed into the image, the likeness of Jesus, None of us are there. Where are the places that they can be transformed? Where are the places that you need to be transformed? And then we ask, how do you help someone else in that transformation? How do you help someone get there? Well, one of those things is to walk through them through the scriptures. To help them see an image of God. If it's someone who's a new believer, I want to walk with them. And, and not hold them to 
this standard of you have to look this way and act this way, but instead let's look at the scriptures together so that you can see the image of Jesus. And I'm going to be willing to ask the questions and talk them through what it is to be transformed. Um, this week I would ask that you spend some time asking the Lord what is in your heart? What have you held on to? What is, what is a stronghold that, that you won't let him come into and change? What are the absolute things that you hold to? How have you ordered your life where you don't need him? Pray that you would be blessed this week uh, through the scripture and seeing the Lord uh, through your time in prayer and that this would be uh, a great, as we lead up into Easter, a great time of celebrating what he has done and helping you to walk forward and making, being a disciple of Jesus, being transformed more into his likeness and helping others to do the same. Next week we'll be talking about being on mission with Jesus and that gets a little contentious with some but hopefully we can walk through that uh, with some, some new insight, some clarity uh, and just excitement about what we can be a part of uh, as God reconciles the world to himself and brings it under the authority of Jesus.